Morning, guys. Good morning. How are we doing today? Good. Hey, I want to honor you guys. Anybody that's willing to get up at 5:30 in the morning, whatever time you got up, I'm sure whatever time you got up was earlier than me, because my alarm went off at six o'clock. <laughs> six o'clock. Uh, my, my alarm did not go off. I heard the chimes go at six o'clock and went. Um, this is a problem. So I rolled out of bed and raced down here and got here as fast as I could. But. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring a message uh, this morning that, honestly, this is for me. Sorry, guys. You guys are just really looking good at the, at the backdrop. But I said, Lord, what do you want, what do you, what do you want to teach me? Because nobody learns more than, the, more than the teacher. And I said, God, I, I just need ins inspiration. Anybody need inspiration this morning? Amen. Where does, where does passion come from? <clears throat> uh, I titled this message, A Marathon Mentality. Because I'm just looking for... Some inspiration. I'm looking for a marathon mentality. And you know who inspired me for this message? <clears throat> I'll tell you who inspired me. My good friend, Malin Tobias, inspired me for this message. Because Malin, you did something pretty, pretty dang cool last weekend. What did you do? Ran a half marathon. Is that awesome? Can you give it up for my buddy Malin? <laughs> Which is, how many Brazilian miles is that? 13.1. 13.1. That, no, that is so dang cool. Um, Howard Head, does somebody have a Bible? Anybody got a Bible with them that they brought this morning? Real, real handy? <laughs> Some, somebody, uh, any, any of you who want to look this up, my key text that I'm going to uh, be speaking from is 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. If you can start queuing that up, I'm going to ask somebody to read that. Howard Hendricks said, I never met a Christian who sat down and planned to live a mediocre life. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 24, and follow, uh, 24 through 27. 1 Corinthians 9. Howard Hendricks said, I never met a Christian who sat down and said, you know what? I, my goal in life is to, to live a mediocre life. Ever, ever met anybody who said, yeah, I just I really want to be average. I'm struggling with, with my kids right now because they really think that a C is okay. Come on, Dad, I got a C. What's wrong with that? I said, well, you know, a C is right there flat average, and you are not an average kid. Uh, I mean, anybody just say, you know, if I can just be average, that would just be awesome. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, salvation, what Jesus did on the cross, what's the price of salvation? What's the price of salvation? This priceless. isn't a trick question. Priceless. Free. Priceless. It's free. Thank you. It is priceless, and it's free. That is great news. <clears throat> Forgiveness is free. But what about a transformed life? Is that free? No. Uh -uh. <coughs> you know, what? when this was pointed out to me, salvation is absolutely free. A gift that comes by faith. But a transformed life, that requires something. And a fruitful life, well, that requires something too. It requires um, being faithful to something. It requires some effort to do something to cooperate with God's Spirit. It's not free. First Corinthians chapter 9, this is what Paul says. Somebody read it. Who wants to read it? He's got a nice, bold right. voice. Awesome, John. Thank you. <clears throat> Neither let us test Christ as some of them tested him and were destroyed by the serpents. Wait a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm sorry. That's all right. I have it. There we go. Starting verse 24 through 27. Do you know that those who run on a race course all run, but one receives the prize? Run in this way, that you may lay hold, and everyone who contends exercises self-control in all things. They then, that they may receive a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore run in this way, not as though without clear aim. I box in this way, not as though beating the air, but I buffet my body and make it my slave, lest perhaps having preached to others, I myself may become disapproved. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Paul gives us a picture of an athlete. I, I love that idea of the athlete as a picture of life. Why? Because I'm not an athlete. I'm certainly not a good athlete. Um, but if the athlete, who we all see, we all see on, on TV, the, the NFL star, the, uh, the guys who just dedicate their life to the absolute best of excellence, if that guy works that hard for a ring on his finger, yeah. Isn't the life pursuing Christ worth so much more? Yeah. 
Isn't it worth so much more? You think about uh, the headlines, uh, Thomas Howard. You know who Thomas Howard is? From the Raiders? He was a, here's a guy uh, who, his, it, it, uh, it was the headlines uh, this week, uh, just lost his contract to the Raiders, played for uh, 2008 to 2011, something like that. And they let him go. When they, they let him go, and he said, I got nothing else to live for. And they, when they found the car, the car was absolutely unrecognizable. They estimated he was going 120 miles an hour. He had, presumably, nothing left to live for. Everything that he poured his life into, everything that 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 the pursuit of excellence stood for in his life was all taken away from him. And he said, "What? What I got nothing to live for? I'm going out in a blaze of glory." And you couldn't even recognize the car. But the pursuit of Christ in His kingdom is worth even the highest price, higher higher than, than even the professional athletes. Now I, I I need this because. Again, the, the image of, it, of, it, of an athlete is something that every time I try to reach beyond my grasp of something, something physically, I say, that opens the door to what God wants to teach me. Uh, I remember the first marathon that I, that I ran, the, the lessons that God taught me that, uh, several triathlons, climbing 14ers, being on the mountain, learning the lessons of the mountain. And last time I spoke, I told you guys I was training for something. Uh, my, the, my, my pursuit at that time was my first century ride. At that, uh, before, a couple of months ago, I had never ridden a bike more than 25, 30 miles. 30 miles is probably my max ride. And I said, what would it like to string together 100 miles? So I'm going to do that. So I trained all summer, and last month I rode my first century, the century, the, the Temecula century here. And I tell you, every time I, 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 uh, I asked, uh, I, 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 I told people, hey, we're going to ride the century. Hey, which one? Temecula. Temecula? Your first century is going to be the Temecula century? I'm like, yeah, 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 what's wrong with that? Well, you know, it's like 6,700 miles uh, 6,700 feet of elevation. I'm like, is that a lot? I don't. I didn't have anything <laughs> to rest. And they're like, good luck. Oh, great. So, my buddy and I trained for that, and uh, just as God always does, He taught me a lot. Uh, my problem is now that I'm done. What next? I don't know what next. I need to be inspired. What's the core problem? The core problem of uh, that keeps us from the marathon mentality is what the ancients would have called sloth. Sloth. What is sloth? Well, it's interesting. You know the, the, all the, the the ancient vices, the seven vices: uh, you know, greed, lust, pride, etc. Sloth was the most distinctly modern of those. In fact, it was a, it was a vice that wasn't even mentioned by the Greeks or the Romans. Sloth wasn't. Why? Because they're the highest ideal, according to the world, was a life of ease, kick back, relax. That's the ideal life. It's distinctly modern. That, uh, uh, that we say, wait, wait, sloth, is that a, is, is that a problem? What are some acronyms, that, or so, some of the words that we use for, for sloth? We don't use that, it's not a Laziness. 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 Well, the, laziness is certainly connected to it, but it's more than laziness. Sloth is an attitude that just gives up on anything, particularly the, the, the pursuit of, of God, the pursuit of truth, whatever's good, whatever's beautiful. Sloth says, nah, I'm going to give up on that. Laziness might <coughs> Laziness might, you know, the laziness just says, I'm, I'm going to get there, but I'm not going to get there very fast, and I'm not going to do my best. So it's, it, it's similar, but it's different. What other, what other or, or, uh, titles? Procrastination. For Procrastination, same kind of, kind of similar idea. I'm going to get there, but maybe I'm not sure where. What about idleness? <clears throat> Being idle. Sloth is actually not idleness. Peter Creech said, relaxing is not sloth. The person who never relaxes is not a saint, but a fidget. Somebody, you remember that, that, that just somebody just, you can't sit down. They're always up, they're always do, doing something. They just, they can't relax. They are always have to be busy doing, 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 mind going. And they just, and you said, would you just sit down and stop? <laughs> not healthy. <clears throat> well, let me give you a definition. You don't have to write this down, but if there's one word, sluggishness. Sloth would be sluggishness. Sluggishness of the spirit, sluggishness of the emotions, the mind, the body. A sluggishness that rejects the worthwhileness of anything that requires effort. The slug just says, nah, not interested. Too hard. <laughs> Too hard. Another author says uh, sloth is the leanness of the soul. I like that. The leanness of the soul. With that, with that definition, you can picture somebody that on the outside, very, you know, uh, uh, strong. Uh, uh, on the outside, they got it all together. Positionally, they're, they're solid, but spiritually dead and soulishly weak. 
You could be a sloth and still look like you got it all together. Physically strong, positionally powerful, but a leanness of the soul. Where does it come from? It stems from a hatred of all things spiritual, particularly, that require effort. Chaucer said, sloth will endure no hardship, nor any penance. <coughs> German philosopher uh, Goethe said, sloth is the anvil on which all sins are fashioned. It starts off as an indifference to ideals. It starts off seemingly innocent and says, dude, whatever, man, live and let live. That's okay. I'm just, 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 it's just a, an indifference. But it ends in despair of salvation itself. Dorothy Sayers on Sloth says, in the world it calls itself tolerance. Hey, I'm just, I'm just tolerant, man. Do, do your own thing. But it's not for me. It's not for me. It, 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 it starts with, I don't wish to. And it ends with, I can't. It starts with, I don't want to do that. It progresses to, I, I won't. And it ends with, I can't. What's Paul's antidote to that? When Paul screams out, hey, work out your salvation yes. with fear and trembling. You don't hear that quoted very often. Wait, 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 work it out. Hey, Jesus, Jesus died on the cross. He did it all for me. Yeah, well, work it out. Do it. Just watch Private, Saving Private Ryan with my boys last week. One of the most powerful films. When he says, earn this. Remember that, that line? He just, he just grabs my cause. He says, earn this. Man, the first time I saw that movie, I couldn't speak for 15 minutes. I couldn't speak. Because I saw my Savior on the cross say, earn this. Now don't get me wrong, there's not a thing I can add to, to Jesus' death on the cross. There's not one thing I can add. But man, if I don't rise to the occasion to say, God, what can I, what can I bring that would be worthy of such a sacrifice? Earn this. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Well, per, the, the, the outline of my message is to give you a couple of reminders. So what does a marathon mentality look like? I'm going to, uh, six things, if, if you're going to jot them down. Six things. Number one, have a purpose. Have a purpose. Now, I'm sure that you're not inspired by that. And I'll, I'll, if you're anything like me, when you hear a speaker say, talk about purpose in life, it would be perfectly acceptable to me if you took off your shoe and just chucked it at me right now. <laughs> because when I hear somebody just say, hey, do you know what your mission statement is? Do you know what your purpose is? Do you know your life? That's just, I, I don't know about you, but it leaves me flat. It leaves me flat because I'm thinking, well, what, what does that mean? What does that mean? I mean, ultimately, when it comes down to it, the high, you know, when the, when the, when the lawyer went to Jesus and said, what, what's the law? How do you how to fulfill the law? Well, love God, love people, right? Love God, love people. Would anybody be inspired if you walked out tonight and said, hey, that's all you got to do is just go love God, love people. And you go, okay, uh, what does that look like? Let me, let me just add this. Uh, let, let, let me just... Uh, give this one piece to, to purpose that helped me. Your purpose, men, is multiple, not singular. It's multiple, not singular. It is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. It is to love others as yourself. But how you do that, how you fulfill your purpose, how you love God, how you serve people, well, that depends on which hat you're wearing. You know you have many hats in your life. You have different roles in your life. In fact, you got six of them. If you're jotting things down, you might want to jot these things down. Because what your purpose is is going to be reflected in one of, one of the roles that you wear. And all of us have at least uh, six hats that we wear. How, if you're married, you got a hat that you wear in your marriage. If you've got a family, you've got a, a role that you have in your family as a dad. In your career, that's a hat that you wear. In your community, that's a hat that you wear. In your relationships with your friends, that's a hat that you wear. And your own personal life, that's a hat that you wear too. So when we talk about have a purpose in your life, well, which one of those? What's your purpose? For, and, and in each one of those, I'm sure you'd have something that would come to mind when you say, what's my role as, my, as, a, as, a, as a dad? Well, as a dad, you know, my boys are 13, 14 years old, and, and, and I, I got some words really clear that, that I want to do. I want to have a, a safe house for them to come in. I want there to be peace in my house. I want to be an all their dad that they know that whatever goes on in their lives, they can come and they're going to find grace in my house. Those are just three words that God's given me for my family. Well, that's a purpose. That's a purpose as, as a dad that I want to have. I want to be a dad who's gracious and peace-filled and has, and has a safe environment for my family. And there's, other, there's others for those. But we got to it, 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 we, we think about those things. In your different roles and the hats that you wear, what's your purpose? 
Think that through. Number two, perseverance. Man, listen to this. Psalm 128, verse 1. Listen to this. Blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in His ways. You're going to eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperities are yours. Let me read that again. Blessed are all who fear the Lord, who, who walk in His ways. You will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperity will be yours. Okay, so blessings. Blessing to who? Those who fear God. Okay. So it starts with fear, and then leads to, well, those who walk in His ways. Okay, so you need to walk. If you fear, it starts with fear, and then you're walking. How do we walk? We have to walk in His ways. Oh, okay. And then what does that blessing look like? Do you see what that blessing looks like? You will eat the fruit of your labor. Man, if you were to eat the fruit of your labor today, what would that look like? <laughs> wow. The blessings that God wants to give you says you will eat the fruit of your labor. Wait a minute. It starts with the fear of God. It moves into walking. That walking takes a direction to walk in His ways, and the end result of it is you're going to eat the fruit of your labor. Wow. Wow. Anybody feeling the weight of some responsibility from that verse? Hope so. Hope I didn't chase you guys away. No sweat, guys. Have a great day. <laughs> Nike sells an awful lot of athletic shoes. Did you know that? Not, not many of them get worn out. 87% of Americans own running <laughs> shoes, but don't run. Is that great? Is that great? Um, one of my favorite, uh, uh, you know, <coughs> back, back to, I was telling you about my century, my century experience. <clears throat> one of the hardest things that I've ever done. 178, from my count on their website, 178 uh, uh, racers started out. Only 142 finished. 36 didn't finish. Do you know who the last to finish was? Yours truly. Amen. Last place. They kept the course open for me <laughs> to finish. But you know what? There was 36 guys and gals ahead of me that didn't even finish. I came in last place, but I finished. One of my favorite stories about perseverance comes from the 1968 Summer Olympics. This might be familiar to you. Uh, in Mexico City, now the marathon, if you're watching a marathon, you don't like queue up TiVo to watch a marathon. It's not something that's a real exciting event. The race began and eventually the winner came back and then the other, the other, the, the other events uh, continued to go on. Other uh, runners arrived, but eventually the race is over <clears throat> and uh, the marathon continued. Except there's one single lone runner that was still running the course. An hour passes, two hours passes, hour, several hours pass. The other events are continuing in the stadium, but finally, there's one final runner from Tanzania who comes into, into the stadium. His pace is slow. People don't even notice him. His steps are wobbly. His knees are bloody from a fall that he had taken earlier in the race. He looked absolutely terrible. And slowly people start noticing, what, what's going on? What's the, the, some guy's on the track down there. He's coming in. And people start to see what's going on. And then they start to applaud. And as he made a way around the track, he finally crosses the finish line with the crowd's attention. And they're on their feet and they're cheering this man's the salute to his determination. The reporters came up to him and said, why, why did you finish? You're hours after the, the last guy. And here's what he said. He said, my people in Tanzania, they didn't send me here to Mexico City to start the race. They sent me to finish the race. Wow. Is that awesome? Is that awesome? Good for him. Now, in, in putting in, 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 in my research in this message, what I also notice is I don't know what his name is. Every time you quote a story from the, the Olympics, you always know the guy's name. I don't know what this guy's name is. Now, I'm, I'm sure it's known in, in the annals of history. I don't know what his name is, and it doesn't matter. But he finished. He finished last. But he finished. Perseverance, man. Perseverance. Number three, sacrifice. Sacrifice. Uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Uh, if that name's not familiar to you, he's, uh, he's the, 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 the Russian uh, survivor of the gulag, the, the, the prison, prison camps uh, in, in Russia. He spoke uh, in, in Harvard, and he said these words. It's amazing. Check this out. Solzhenitsyn said, In the United States, the difficulties are not a minotaur or a dragon, nor imprisonment, hard labor, death, government harassment, and censorship. But... Rather, the hardships are cupidity. Think about that word. We'll come back to it. 
cupidity, boredom, sloppiness, indifference. Not the acts of a mighty, all-pervasive, repressive government, but the failure of a listless public wow. to make use of the freedom that is its birthright. Wow. wow. Cupidity. What does that word mean? Cupidity. What do you think of that? Cupid. You know what comes to mind for me with this, this word cupid? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that little, you know, that little chubby angel, you know, guy. Where do you see that? Valentine's. Valentine's. Valentine's, the little precious moments, those little trinkets that are so cute, and the little, what are they, they call pewter, those little pewter things, right? Um, who wants their life to look like a precious moments cupid? Trinket. Nice, cute, interesting, utterly safeless and lifeless, uh, safe and lifeless. Its only purpose is to sit in the corner on that shelf that gets dusted every never, behind glass, safe and utterly forgotten. Is that a picture of a lack of sacrifice in our country today? What does Jesus say about that? Luke 14, verse 25, he tells this story. One day, when large groups of people were walking, walking along with him, probably bored, probably complaining, and Jesus turns around, and, and he, he turns around, and you just, you know, when you hear somebody complaining, that rah, 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 I can't believe this, this is so far, I'm hungry, blah, blah. Jesus turns around, and he speaks these words to him. He told him, anybody who comes to me but refuses to let go of father, mother, spouse, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even your own self, you can't be my disciple. Do you see their faces? Just, what? What? Anyone who won't shoulder his cross and follow behind me can't be my disciple. If there's anyone here who's planning to build a new house, well, let me tell you the story. If you don't first sit down and figure out how to count the cost so that you'll be able to comp uh, so that you'll know that you'll be able to complete it. If you only get to the, the, the foundation laid and then you run out of money, you're going to look pretty foolish. Everybody passing by was going to poke fun at you. Hey, he started something, but he couldn't even finish it. Well, how can you, or, or can you imagine a king that goes into a battle against another king, but first couldn't, uh, uh, but, but without deciding whether it's possible with his 10,000 troops to face the one with 20,000 troops? And if he decides that he can't, won't he send an emissary out and say, hey, can we work out a truce here? Simply put, if you're not willing to take what is most dear to you, plans or people, and kiss it goodbye, you can't be my disciple. Wow. Wow. You just see a lot of people going, okay, Jesus, got it. We're out of here. We're out of here. We're out of here. Half of getting what you want, man, is knowing what you're willing to sacrifice to get. Isn't that true? Requires sacrifice. And, and also notice, before moving on, those who make sacrifices, those, those who live a life of continual sacrifice, they never get bored. Are we a society that gets bored? Sometimes I just get bored. I just get bored. And I need to remember, you know what? Are you, are you putting the effort in, Andy? Are you making sacrifices? Because those who make sacrifices don't get bored. Number four. <clears throat> Let me tell you what Jesus said. Blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Why? For they will be satisfied. Number four, have a hungry soul. A hungry soul. Am I hungry? Am I thirsty? Or am I somebody who's just really well fed? <laughs> What's interesting is, what does that mean for the role of suffering? Do we suffer from a lack of a developed theology of suffering? What if the greatest asset that you have <coughs> in your life are the adversities that God brings your way? Whoa. Whoa. How can... Who is it? Uh, is it uh, James? Peter? Who said, uh, consider joy, consider it joy when you encounter various trials? Now, trials aren't very fun. What if that was your greatest source of joy, was the adversity that, that comes to a hungry heart who says, Lord, I put me in a place of need so that I know when you fill it. Now, the light on this comes from another camp, Albert uh, 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 Camus, a philosopher who wrestled with these ideas and never found a reason for living. Camus said this, he said, I see many people die because they judge that life is not worth living. But I see others paradoxically getting killed for ideas that give them the reason for living. Isn't that a paradox? Everybody wants to live a life well lived. 
But in a, in a culture of comfort and cupidity, few want it really badly. And even here, the Christ-driven the Christ life is so gracious. Peter Kreef points out, hunger is even easier than faith. You know, hunger is easier than faith. Because faith is about finding. But merely seeking, merely seeking overcomes sloth. Because seeking turns into finding. And finding turns into joy, and joy overcomes sloth. Isn't that great? But the marathon mentality doesn't start with faith. It starts with hunger. It starts with thirst. And thirst drives you forward. Men, how thirsty are you? Number five, focus on the reward. Focus on the reward. The whole Christian perspective is a forward-looking uh, perspective. Philippians 3.12 says, Not that I've already obtained this, or that I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what's behind, straining towards what's ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize. Wait, I thought the prize was already won for me. No, no, I want to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Take hold of it. The, uh, another translation, the Amplified, says, I want to make that my own. Mm. Jesus died. He gave it to me. How, I want to do what I have to do to make it my own, to own it, to claim it, to earn it. My century reward, when I, when I ran, was I just wanted to finish. I just wanted to finish and not be disqualified. In the Isthmian Games, the, the precursor to the marathon in Corinth, um, the race, I, you might have heard, I, I, I think I've said this before, the race did not go to the best athlete, right? The athlete was given a torch to, 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 to carry. And if the fastest runner crosses the finish line and his torch went out, guess what? He was disqualified. Mm. The, win, the, the, the medal went to the one who crosses the finish line with his torch still lit. You're disqualified if your torch isn't lit. Crossing the finish line. Wow. Yeah, right, wow. It's not how fast you get there. I didn't want to be disqualified. I'll tell you, one of the most, uh, I, I, I told you, God teaches me in, the, in these moments when I, when, I reach out, when, I, when, I, when I reach beyond my grasp. My teachable moment in this century came on mile about 75. I, I finished the first stage, I finished the second stage, and I'm going into the third stage. And it was a 103 mile uh, race. And there's a little cutoff that goes up into the mountains around the industrial area. And I'm, I'm, I, if I'm not at the beginning of the third stage by 3.30, uh, I'm disqualified. They will close the track. And I told, the, I told them, you can push me off my bike, but I'm going to finish this. I don't care if it's midnight. I don't care if it's official or not. I'm going to finish this race. But there's a three-mile loop that we don't have time to, to race. And my buddy, who's, who races circles around me, he, he crosses continents on his bike. He says, you know what? We don't need to do that. Let's just make it to the, uh, to the beginning of the, of the first stage. I had a question. I, 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 I had a dilemma that I had to face. Do I cut off that three miles and go to the third stage uh, and, uh, and at least finish the race and not be disqualified? But I will have not run the full three miles. What do I do? And my buddy's saying, we, we need to go, we need to go. And I'm like, dude, my, I'm resolved. I am not going to run this race and have one foot less than every single buddy, everybody else that runs this race. I'm going the three miles. And he says, okay, I'll see you. And I didn't think I would see him again. He took off in one direction, and I went. And you know how many bikes I saw on that, uh, on that three miles? Not one. It was the loneliest moment. I'm riding, and I'm starting to choke up, going, God, this is pretty lonely. In fact, there was a, 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 a fuel station that had already closed down. There was nobody there. I'm riding up this hill, nobody around me, nobody at the fuel station, and I'm, th I'm probably going to get disqualified because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss the, the, uh, uh, the beginning of the third stage. And I come down that hill, and I think, well, at least I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish this thing, but I'm going to be disqualified. And you know who the first two people are at the base of the hill that I see? My wife and my kid. Uh, Jared. Oh, they're at the base of the hill. Hey, come on down. I'm like, Lord, thank you. Thank you. I make it to the beginning of the third stage. I got three minutes uh, before I, uh, I, I made the cutoff by three minutes. I was the last one to make the cutoff and was able to finish the race. Um, t uh, lap. All right, so uh, focus on the reward and don't be disqualified. And la last point, I'll make this fast. Take control. 
Last point in the marathon mentality, take control. Action dispels fear. The hardest mile to run is which mile, man? Last mile, first. Last, last, last or the first? What's the, first. the hardest mile to run? First. 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 That last one's pretty darn easy. Once you get that last one, it's a piece of cake. The hardest mile to run is the first one. Get off your butt, get onto the track. Once you get on the track, man, it's good, it's good, I'm good, I'm good. But the hardest mile to run is that first mile. Take control. Let me close with, uh, uh, with a story about my buddy Sam Schmidt. Malin and I had the opportunity to go um, um, do something really fun two weeks ago. Uh, my, my buddy, uh, he, he runs this uh, uh, foundation, and he does this golf tournament in Vegas every, every week. And you know those exotic cars out on the racetrack? Um, Lamborghinis, Ferraris, all those, all those things. His, his opening party was, uh, was out on the racetrack in Las Vegas racing the exotic cars. So it literally, it was go go and pick your car. They had the new Corvette, they had Austin Martins, they had the Goldwing Mercedes, they had what three Lamborghinis, they had two Ferraris, they had the Austin Martin, they had the uh, the Audi. Pick a car, yours to race five laps. Are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> Which car did you race, Manly? The uh, Superleggera Ferrari. Uh, uh, Lamborghini. Lamborghini Super, I mean, it's 580 horsepower. Uh, I, I got to race a, la a Lamborghini as well. Sam's an Indy race car driver, or was an Indy race car driver, until he put himself into a wall at 150 miles an hour, and for the last uh, eight plus years, he's a quadriplegic. Sam can't move a muscle below his neck. Uh, so what did he do? He turned around. Uh, he can't race anymore. He can't pick up his, uh, his daughter, he can't pick up his son, he can't throw his arms around his wife. But instead of racing, Sam now owns two Indy race car teams. In fact, he's now the third fastest team in the Indy uh, race, uh, behind Penske and uh, uh, some guy that I, that I don't know who he is. And uh, he's number three and number 16, he finished the, the season. Uh, where his two teams. Sam knows what I need to be reminded of, uh, of all the time. You know how you know how Sam still starts his day? He's a quadriplegic in his wheelchair. He starts his day every day exercising. In the, on the, they, they lock him into a treadmill and move him. They put him in the, uh, in, in the, uh, uh, on, on the bike and move him. Why? Because he knows the value of just getting out there and doing it, keeping his, everything limber, uh, putting the electrodes on him and doing all that stuff. He still knows the value of physical training. And he's a quadriplegic. I need Sam in my life. He has to remind me. Andy, what's your excuse? Take control of this one and only life, have a marathon mentality. Purpose, perseverance, sacrifice, hungry soul, focus on the reward, and take control. With that, let's pray. Father, thank you um, for the inspiration of your word, for the inspiration of your spirit. And Father, we thank you that there's not one thing we can add to our salvation, Lord, because you paid the price for us to be with you. Yet, Father, your, your calling, we're reminded this morning, is one of of effort of us to come in to this relationship that you provided 100% free of charge with the faith that you've given us. But Father, we're reminded that uh, a life of purpose and a life of effectiveness and a life of faithfulness comes with us coming in uh, desiring, Lord, for you to work in our lives. Lord, help us to take a marathon mentality that we would look back and eat the fruit of our labor because of your blessings. And we thank you for our time this morning. Pray for Jesus. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, man.